Modern emphasis is primarily on chemical factors for growth. The rest is taken for granted, right? I mean, couldn't you put it that simply? And if you do, and if you look at the reports, and I do this too, it's just minerals, minerals, minerals. We're always talking about minerals and what we need to grow our crops, and it all comes down to the inorganic nutrients that crops require. Why is it that we're so silent about soil health? Why is it that the whole microbial underworld is not being discussed or is considered, as this suggests, to be taken for granted? So here's a picture of what I call the soil biology underground. And this soil biology underground is the source of, of everything that I will lump together today called soil respiration, the breathing of the living soil. And if you break it down into two quadrants, you have the content of organic matter in your soil, which is largely comprised of plant roots and litter in the process of decay, soil organisms, 5%, and humus, which is decayed litter that has been transformed by microorganisms into an, a poorly defined high molecular weight structure that binds soil particles and has longevity up to 1,000 years in soil. But only 5% of that is microbes. So it, that may sound like a very small amount, but if you break the microbes out and look at what's going on there, and this is just an approximation. This was from a, a, a German soil biology institute that did this and gave it to me recently. Uh, they broke it down into algae and fungi in one group, bacteria, actinomycetes in another, and soil animals. And you can see that the soil animals portion is significantly less, of course, and that varies and depends on your management practices. Certainly, there's, there's much less soil animals if you're in a tillage system. And the thing that's really impressing me as I study no-till farms is the increase in the earthworms that we're observing. So the animal content is changing in the soil. But we, we see very similar uh, ratios of bacteria and fungi. But so there's this whole world in the soil that we've been ignoring for so long. So um, here's an attempt to quantify it, and I owe this some of these numbers here to Jim Horman and Rafiq Islam at Ohio State University. Uh, they put this out in some literature on their website a little while ago. When, when you hear people talk about the numbers of microbes in soil, it's kind of it's difficult to comprehend. We say 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9. I mean, 10 to the 9 is a billion organisms. Uh, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 fungi, that's 100,000 to a million. These numbers are huge, right, and it's hard to relate to them. And you often hear people say in one teaspoon of soil is more microbes than uh, human beings on the whole planet. And I, I ask people what that says to them, and they say, I, we don't know how to relate to that. That's, like, that's a dimensionless number. So it's more interesting to look at the biomass. The biomass is what would they actually weigh if you could measure them? And I took their biomass figures and then I converted it into pounds an acre. And again, this is just using, I took the ranges that they have and I compared it to some tests that I had done recently that modified them up and down. And so you could have a ton, a little more than a ton of bacteria, a ton of actinomycetes, nearly a ton of fungi in a really healthy soil, and, and much less just in pounds of algae, protozoa, and nematodes. But add that all up, that's worth several animals per acre. Now, there's a very popular um, comic going around the country on how many cows are hiding under your soil. And um, one of the things I, I, I just threw this cartoon up here is you know, this is their niche under the soil, but the size of these guys is one micron. That's like four one hundred thousandths of an inch. That's why this is so difficult. We can't see these organisms. If this, if this were cows, there'd be one, two, three, four, maybe four or five cows per acre. You'd see it, you'd feed it. But what you don't see ain't there. And this whole thing about these hidden organisms and microbes in the soils, what's so challenging to me is to try to make this more visible. And once we make it visible, to develop the methods of quantifying it meaningfully, 
to get reproducibility and quantification and then start relating it to your practices. So let's quantify it. And I'm, again, I'm going to give you all kinds of examples of quantification here. Uh, if we had 50,000 pounds per acre of organic matter, uh, which is uh, just 2.5% organic matter, you could easily have a ton of microbes living on that. And they, think of them like the cows eating every day. And they are cycling the organic matter, and they're pumping out, using this formula here, about 100 pounds a day of CO2 into the air. If you could wear infrared goggles and walk around your farm, you would be amazed that the CO2 is just streaming out of the soil constantly. And the more alive the soil is, the more is coming out of the soil. At the same time, for each unit of CO2 that's coming out of the soil, the nitrogen that was associated with it as an organic molecule has now been set free. And on a very active day, we've measured the transfers as much as one to five pounds of nitrogen in one day came out of the CO2 respiration cycle. Now you think of that and how you ignore it when you put down your nitrogen. You think nature is trying to feed your plant and on a warm, moist day with active soil, five pounds of nitrogen could be set free for the plant. That's why this is so significant. And that's why farmers that are getting their soils better and better are telling me we're able to reduce our fertilizer and we're not seeing any reduction in yield. In fact, almost the opposite. Typically, you wouldn't want to sample um, less than two days after a rainfall event. Luckily, here in Maine, uh, we have very well-drained soils with lots of organic matter, so it's less of an issue here. Uh, there's never standing water. So we want to sieve it down to a coarse sieve. Um, it's about a quarter millimeter, or I'm sorry, quarter inch sieve. And we're trying to make sure that there are no rocks that get through, and then we want to take out any um, obvious roots um, or grass that may get in our sample as well. Yeah, and it's more material than, than we could possibly need. We, out of this, we could actually run several tests. We need 100 grams. We have a version of it that's used in laboratories and they have a device that reads it automatically, but it's still a good old-fashioned colorimetric test with a color chart that you can do yourself. And we created kind of an arbitrary scale for it of one to five, or zero to five. Zero being a, a completely lifeless soil, I've never ever had a soil test zero, but the probe starts at zero here at the beginning of the test. And Every color unit here is a doubling of respiration. So you can see the scale goes up very rapidly. And, and if you do a lot of them at side by side and lay them all out, you can photograph them and preserve it that way. And it's actually, the human eye is amazing. We can distinguish small differences in color as accurately as a photometer when you have color, a range of colors side by side. So I tell people, don't ever just do one test. Do a couple at the same time, and then lay them side by side. You can see nuances of differences there. And I get lots of phone calls. I say, I can't believe it. And it was either too low, they're really upset <laughs> if it's really low, or it was very high, and they wanted to know why was it very high. And we took one farm and mapped the CO2 every day through the whole season. This was a good growing season, moist soil. And look what it looked like. So the soil, as it warms up, is pushing out more and more CO2. So it's highest in the midsummer and then declines as the soil cools down. 
Um, of course, if you had no moisture in the soil, you'd have some very low numbers there. So what we're trying to do is just to move this kind of paradigm into soil testing and get people to start monitoring it. We're not saying we know exactly how to interpret it, but to start looking at the life of your soil is, is one of the important things. Is a healthy soil capable of providing your plants with enough carbon dioxide for photosynthesis? Because if it is, it's also providing it a significant amount of nitrogen and of phosphorus through the release in a nitrogen mineralization and phosphorus mineralization cycle. And I think this is one of the most important things um, that we can really dwell on now in showing quantitatively the significance of this. This is not just an academic interest, is your soil alive or not? It's we want to make it practical so it can help you reduce some of your inputs. And this is a question today um, that if we could do some of these energy budget studies on no-till cover crop farms and compare them to conventional neighbors, I bet we would see some dramatic differences.